Right. Well, um, I hope that we're having people that are joining from all parts of the US and uh, maybe we can cover some people from California to uh, the Midwest to the East Coast. But I think we're, we're ready to get started. What do you think, Jade? Good, all right. <laughs> all right, well, good afternoon or early evening to wherever you are. My name is Diana Dabdub and I am the Director for Admissions and Recruitment Affairs at the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges. Joining me today is Jade Hernays from Michigan State University. She is a first year veterinary student. And so we wanna thank you for joining us for our webinar, Vet Med Pathways, A Million Ways to Care. So today we're gonna to discuss um, careers in veterinary medicine, kind of what it entails, and then hear a little bit about Jade's story and how she became interested in becoming a veterinarian. So, do you have a love of animals? Math, science? Well, if you answered yes to any of these, then I hope you're considering a career in veterinary medicine because that might be the right path for you. So you can turn your passion into medical understanding, compassionate care and rewarding work. So why veterinary medicine? So specifically a degree in veterinary medicine really just provides you a lifetime of excitement and no day is ever the same from your beloved neighborhood veterinarian to researchers that are doing important work in, you know, to protect our food supply, veterinary medicine careers really span many industries and environments. And there's really endless ways to care for animals and our planet. So what specifically is veterinary medicine? It's really preventing diseases and healing animals is really at the core of what, what, what veterinarians do, but they also um, deal with, you know, preventing, managing, diagnosing, treating diseases, um, disorders and injuries in animals, domestic and wild. <clears throat> and specifically, they also do contribute to the health of animals, people, and our planet. And so really our veterinarians are at that forefront of protecting public health and welfare. And we really need people that are compassionate and understanding about those connections between animal health and human health, as well as uh, the environmental health. So all those three things together. So what are some um, medical workers within veterinary medicine? So of course you have your veterinarian, right? And they are the physician who protects the health of both animals and humans. But they also look at, uh, you know, they could be veterinarians that are looking at, at caring for companion animals. So that's like your small, you know, your cats and dogs, or they may be working in zoos or wildlife parks, aquariums. They may work in um, academia, so at a university or in research. They also focus on public health and regulatory medicine. You also do have within the veterinary workforce, veterinary technicians. So they assist veterinarians with surgery, laboratory procedures, radiology, anesthesiology, treatment and nursing, and client education. So there are some states that may require you to be licensed or, or pass a credentialing exam to be a veterinary technician, but that really is dependent on the state. And then lastly, there are veterinary assistants that support the veterinarian or the veterinary technician really in their daily tasks. And that could be things like performing kennel um, work, assisting in restraining animals or handling animals, feeding, um, exercising the animals or spending time on clerical duties. So for you guys that are either in middle school or high school, you may have um, the ability to be veterinary assistants and then maybe in the future, if you're looking at different career paths and ways to get into veterinary medicine, you may wanna pursue either the path of a veterinary technician or potentially a veterinarian. So what are some other things that, um, you know, careers that span veterinary medicine? So again, we talked about how uh, veterinarians provide animal health care, but they also do other kinds of jobs. So they ensure the nation's food supply is safe, they work to control the spread of diseases. So for example, COVID-19 has kind of a zoonotic origin. Um, you know, they conduct research that helps both animals and humans. And so, you know, things that they could be looking at is working with cattle or food animals, uh, making sure that there's, you know, that there's testing that's done to make sure that there's, you know, preventing the spread of food, um, any illnesses that might be contaminating in the food supply. They're also often in the front lines of surveillance. So that veterinary training can really help 
um, them detect any outbreaks of diseases that may be happening. So zoonotic diseases are diseases that can jump from an animal to a human. And really veterinarians are that unique person that can fill a variety of different roles. And really looking at how veterinarians can take that holistic approach to human well-being as well as animal welfare and combining that with you know, communication and problem solving skills really just makes veterinarians uniquely qualified to fill, like I said, many, many roles. So you're kind of hear a little bit about some of the the types of veterinary careers that I kind of mentioned here, but there's so much more that you can do with the degree in veterinary medicine. So as I mentioned, if you're looking and you're interested in math, science, and you really love animals, this may be the right path for you. So next we're gonna transition and I'm gonna turn it over to Jay to share with um, everyone kind of her path to veterinary medicine. Hi everyone, I'm Jade, like Diana said. So I'm a current first year at Michigan State University, um, but only for one more week, and then I'll be officially a second year. Um, so I just wanted to kind of tell you guys about myself, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask later on. Um, so my story kind of starts in college. So like many students going into college as a science major or a healthcare major, I actually thought I wanted to be a human doctor. But as I kind of got into the um, depth of my science courses and my lectures, I kind of started to lose interest in what I was learning. And I just started to get really unmotivated. And I just realized that, hmm, like maybe being a doctor was something that I did not want to pursue anymore. Um, but what never actually changed was how much I enjoyed spending time and caring for something else or rather someone else. Um, so I wanted to find a way to kind of fill my time, but also not give up science since it was still my favorite subject. So eventually I found an opportunity to just volunteer at a farm um, right by my college, uh, which is Providence College. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it's up in Rhode Island. Um, so I found myself volunteering at the farm, and then little that I know, I started um, working with animals who have been, you know, neglected from the pet care industry, the zoo industry, and um, former circus animals that were no longer wanted. Uh, and in that farm, I also got introduced to wildlife rehabilitation because they also dealt with a lot of the animals in the um, surrounding environment. I don't want to confuse anyone between what wildlife rehab is and veterinary care. So wildlife rehab is another field of animal health care. They're not veterinarians. They are licensed individuals who are granted permission to take in animals that are native to the state or even sometimes the country. It really depends on kind of what animal you're looking at, but it's mostly birds and small mammals. So when I was at that farm, I really realized, okay, like I really like working with animals. So from that point forward, I decided to kind of track the rest of my college courses to dive deeper into animal science. So I got all of my prerequisites out of the way, you know, there are physics, chemistry, calculus out of the way, and then went into animal science towards the end of my college career. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, being in the animal world was something I wanted to do. So when I graduated college, I didn't apply directly into veterinary school yet. Instead, I worked um, in wildlife rehab. So I continued that path from college. And I eventually got my wildlife rehab license just to kind of get me some more exposure and realize um, what is out there. So the more I worked in wildlife rehab, the more I worked with different animals and other people who are working with different types of animals. And I even got more exposure to kind of the vets who came in and out and saw what they did that differed from what wildlife rehabbers did. Um, so from then, the, the more I worked there, the more I realized how much was lacking in the field in terms of how much more help rehabbers can get, how much more help the wildlife and our 
town and community can't, sorry, my cat is begging for food <laughs> for help. Um, so then I started talking to the rehabbers and to the vets and decided I can help the community a lot more by being the expert in the area and seeing kind of how can I treat them in a more efficient way? How can we get these animals out into release so that they can go back and thrive and have babies all year? Um, sorry, I just got a question. Um, sorry, I just got a question. But uh, so from there, I then realized I had to actually leave rehab for a while to kind of dive into what vet med is. So I left my rehab job, but I, because I am a licensed rehabber, I kept my number and my email out there so that if people did find, let's say, a baby squirrel or a baby bird, they know they can contact me and I can still guide them and direct them and where to go. But I ended up we're going towards general practice. So rather than the the possums and the squirrels, like you see in the picture in the slide here, I directed over to only dogs and cats. So the biggest difference between that switch was in wildlife rehab, you're dealing mostly with just the animals um, and mostly animals who are scared of you because they're animals who come from the wild. They're who are injured and were just found by the public. And then you go into general practice where your focus is now on the animals and their owners. So it's a big transition, but it's an awesome transition because you become at that point of um, person where they look to you to answer questions. You start seeing, you know, these puppies and kittens from babyhood to adulthood. You watch them go from being sick to becoming so much better. And it just makes you feel really good and really happy. And it's really satisfying. So just going from wildlife rehab to working at a general practice, it really kind of solidified that I did want to pursue veterinary medicine. And every the community is awesome. All the vets are so willing to help you out. And all over the country, you can literally reach out to anyone and so many people are willing to help you because the community is relatively on the smaller side and we're all just one big happy family. So if you wanna be challenged and if you like fast paced, but you also love animals and you also love people, then vet med is a, a great option. And then if these pictures are kind of, does the animals I've worked with in both in rehab and wildlife rehab and um, in general practice. So you can see when general practice certain clinics and things are a little slow, there's always time to cuddle with the kids or get on the floor and hang out with the dogs um, and or just try and pick up a baby Rottweiler that's three months old that's already bigger than you, like that bottom right picture. So it's always worth, you know, giving it a try if that's something you're willing to challenge yourself on. So a typical day in the life of a veterinary student. So not every um, student has the same schedule. Not every college this is the same. So this is a general schedule for, my, for me at MSU at Michigan State University. So I live around 10 minutes from campus, but I do have animals to feed. So they kind of, they're, my mornings revolve around them. So around 6.30, I wake up and I get myself ready to go. And I also get ready, get the animals ready. I feed them. And if they need to go out, the litter box needs to be cleaned. I take care of that because I don't, I might not really see them until after lab. Um, it really depends on how the day is going. So at 6.30, I wake up and I'm usually out the door by 7.45. And morning lectures are long. <laughs> So at my morning lectures usually go from 8 a.m. to noon, but the professors are very understanding and they know when you need a brain break or a bathroom break. So usually every hour and a half or so, they'll let you leave the room to get a snack, to go to the bathroom, to just stretch and, or walk around the building for about like 10, 15 minutes, um, give and take. And then once noon hits, it's lunchtime. So lunch is really different for a bunch of different people. Um, some students will 
go home and just relax and do nothing for the next hour. Some will go home like myself to walk the dogs, feed the cat, feed the dog, or just simply go back and get that animal love just to de more for de-stressing and decompressing. Um, some people go to the library um, on in the building, the student center to just get started on the next day's work or kind of review what they've been going through that whole day. Or there's also what we have lunch and learns. So we have that almost every day. It's basically lunch is provided by a company or um, a club where they bring in speakers to kind of talk about specific diagnoses or a case that they came up with or just advice for future vets. Um, they have a lot of those for um, for the students on campus. So it's really nice to kind of learn about either cases today or just advice for vets when you graduate. Then after lunch, we have our lab. So lab can either be an anatomy lab, which is a lab where we're working with cadavers. So those are kind of um, disease like preserved animals that are there for the main purpose of kind of learning your anatomical structures. Or you go to either the horse barn, the dairy barn, the um, we call it CSL, and that's where we get, hang out with our dogs. Um, so that's what our labs can kind of consist of. And then usually the day is over on campus around three to four o'clock. But if you're if you love to be involved, there's so many clubs, and these clubs actually host what we call wet labs. So they're entirely volunteer. Um, you, there, you, no one has to be forced to do it. You sign up for it and it's basically um, based on what your, that club is. So let's say it's ophthalmology lab or which is eyeballs um, or feline club lab. You're either working on that evening on a special cat case or you're working on, let's say like dolls and pretending they're clients and seeing like how to put in a certain tube through them, just pretending that it's a real cat for future kids. So it's just more learning opportunities for those who want to learn more. Um, and that's what we call wet labs. And those are usually in the evenings so that everyone from first year, second years, up to fourth years can attend after classes. So that's really why it's in the evening. Um, but that's a typical day. It's a really full, every day is different and every day, can be long, so caffeine is definitely a must, but it's also really important to fit in during some time of the day, whether it's in, during lunchtime or after class to decompress and not be so go, 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 because you will get tired and vet school still is supposed to be fun regardless of how much work there is. So what can you do now to prepare? So um, doesn't matter how old you are, there's so many different types of experiences um, to get yourself ready for applications or even just to get yourself exposed to see if this is what you really want. Um, you can shadow a vet, you could shadow a wildlife rehabber, you could shadow anyone really who works with animals directly. Um, this is... I don't know if this is relevant to um, a lot of you guys yet, but there is a difference between animal care and volunteer, um, and sorry, animal care and veterinary care. So just be mindful of that um, when you're looking for hours to fill. So you, you could shadow, when you're shadowing, just make sure you're shadowing both aspects. So you can volunteer in an animal shelter, a great way to work with dogs and cats and with limited resources. Um, sorry. <laughs> You could also, it's also really, really, really important. I can't stress it enough how important it is to practice your communication skills. Um, whether you're looking for a job to talk to a vet or even um, someone like a wildlife rehabber to kind of get your experience. When you're interviewing, you're going to be talking to so many people. And as a vet in general, no one wants to be working with a vet who doesn't know how to talk to them. You want to be personable. If you wouldn't want to bring your pets to a doctor who doesn't, who's not human. So it's really important to practice now and 
let it come naturally and over eventually it'll be like second nature to you. Let me just get my cat. She's screaming. <laughs> this is Tuna, by the way. <laughs> I got her from one of my clubs in campus. <laughs> um, I actually, so just quick side note, she was one of the cats who um, one of the community members could no longer afford to take care of. So she was actually either going to be euthanized if no one could find her or if she couldn't find a home because she does have peeing and pooping issues. So I took the bait and now I have a cat <laughs> who loves to be spoiled with food. So if you heard screaming, that's because of her. So I apologize for that in advance. Um, but you can go to the next slide. Tons of information on vet school websites and the AABMC. You could also do a quick Google search. Um, lots of colleges have advisors, but it's definitely important to get organized now if you think you're going to go to vet school or if you want to apply, because there are a lot of prerequisites, uh, which, which are classes which are um, necessary or required to go to that school and a lot of colleges are the same but a lot of colleges also require additional classes that other colleges might not need like a second semester of math or a second semester of um, nutrition um, but it's also important to take science and math classes and try to challenge yourself with those classes because you don't want to really take the easy route and then find yourself not being able to do the math or science when you do get to school because you didn't really find a way to challenge yourself. So that's also really important because science and math will take you all the way. They will come back and haunt you for the rest of your life. And I'm, I'm gonna add one more, more thing in, in this slide that we didn't add, <laughs> I'll say verbally, something else for you to do, and you can do this now as a middle school, high school student, is take on leadership roles. Leadership roles is a really great way to practice your communication skills, your leadership skills, and really just how to, you know, bring people together. All of those things are really important. So don't forget, and you know, yes, the science and math are important, but it's the other skills that you need to also make sure that you're not ignoring and making sure that you're practicing. So on here should be, you know, volunteering in clubs, in whatever capacity that you can. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll feel doing it. So if you're a person that maybe you love animals, but you're and you're, the reason maybe you think veterinary medicine is for you is because you're only going to be dealing with the animals, then just kind of getting a little bit out of your comfort zone will really help you. And the more that you do it, just the easier it starts to become. So when it is something that you need to make sure that you are exercising more, right, the, the communication skills, then it won't seem so much more difficult because you've done it in spurts or you've done it in, in iterations that so you just kind of build up that particular skill. Sorry, Jane, I just want to make that point because I think it's important since That's all of the students here are probably leaders <laughs> anyway. That's okay. I'm just asking, um, answering a few questions that some people had in the yeah. chat. Oh, yeah. If you want to maybe say the questions out loud too, you can. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so someone asked me, some are a little bit detailed, but um, one of the general questions were um, how old I was when uh, I uh, applied to vet school and how old I was when I got accepted to vet school. So I actually applied to vet school when I was 25 and then I got in at the end of 25. So I turned 26 in vet school. So I actually took a few gap years. Like I said, I was a wildlife rehabber and then I transitioned onto um, veterinary medicine because I wanted to make sure it is something I wanted to do. It's a very demanding field and you don't really, um, you don't wanna make a mistake and realize when you're in school already or a vet that this is not something you wanna do. So it is something you wanna make sure you're committed to following through because it's not an easy career and um, you just wanna be, be sure. But it's also okay to change your mind. <laughs> um, and then another question that I got um, was about working while you're in school. So a lot of people who actually work in school, I don't know how, um, how other colleges work, but a lot of my classmates, I personally don't work because I like to focus, uh, put all of my focus on clubs and my academics. But a lot of my classmates actually work at the emergency clinic at my school because they're so flexible with student schedules and exam schedules. 
Um, and a lot of the times they're very willing to, if you're suddenly stressed or feeling like you need a break, they're completely okay with saying you don't need to um, come in today. There's always someone who wants the extra money and is willing to cover for you. So it's really, it's personal preference. Some people are good at man time managing all that, but it is a lot of work um, that school. So if you're someone who you think might need extra time to study, I don't necessarily recommend working. Or if you're someone like me who wants to do a lot of wet labs, then you might not want to work as well. So it's really just give and take and sacrifices. And also it's really different um, for everyone because some people might need the extra money. Some people um, might want them, want even more um, exposure to let's say emergency care so they want to keep working or they have loyalties and um people are clinics that they're working for are willing to i know a classmate but this is by as an example a classmate whose um clinic is willing to pay for their education if they continue to work, work a little bit for them while they're in school and then come back to them after as veterinarians um, i'm getting questions but i'll answer them later on because i don't want to yeah, run out of time We'll go to the next a few slides. There's not many more left and then we can answer all the questions you have. Okay. Um, so this is a of advice as a first year and someone who did take the gap years. Um, as someone who went from wildlife, from human medicine to wildlife rehab to veterinary medicine, don't be afraid to change your mind. Um, I came in thinking I was gonna go into GP and work with wildlife rehab. And now that I've been in school, I wanna specialize. And that's five more years on top of school. So if, the, if it's something you want, don't be afraid, go for it, follow your gut. Everything happens as it's supposed to be. And don't, be, don't let things get in the way, like age be a factor. Um, if you want to be a doctor, you might as well be at that age and a doctor, you know? So there's a lot, don't let outside factors be a deterrent to you following what you really want to do. Um, and then my last piece of advice as a student is to not be so hard on yourself. Everyone is on their own journey. Everyone's in their own path. So as during application cycles, you know, something that you really don't want to do that I'm quite guilty of was comparing myself a lot to a lot of the other applicants. And that will quickly, quickly, quickly kill your self-esteem. And it's really important to realize that everyone is in a different trajectory. Everyone has different types of experiences. Just because you have more, someone else might have more emergency care experience doesn't mean they have wildlife experience like I did. So it's really important not to be so down in yourself by comparing yourself to another person. You wouldn't tell your friend who's upset by comparing themselves that, you know, keep being upset, keep, keep comparing your stats to other people's stats, your GPA, your hours, because if you wouldn't tell them that, then you shouldn't tell yourself that. If you know comparing, if you know you're gonna be someone who is going to really feel bad about yourself by comparing, then tell yourself now before applying, don't do it. Just trust in yourself. Everything will happen if it's meant to be. And I'm a firm believer that if you don't get in your first try, then it just, it wasn't meant to be. And it's not, it wasn't your time yet. If, you, if this is something you really are willing to do and be committed to, then it will happen. Because everyone is doing great. Everyone's in their path and everyone should just keep chugging along and working hard. So don't be hard on yourself. If you don't get a grade you don't like, it's not the end of the world. I wasn't a 4.0 in college and I still got into vet school my first try. So don't be so hard on yourself. Well, I think that's that's really our, our last slide before we get into questions. Um, so I think I'm just gonna stop sharing our screen so that way we can see everyone and then answer. I know you got some questions and I got a few as well that we can address. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Actually, we're, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So in case you do want our contact information, you have a moment to, to jot that down. But if there's additional questions that we don't get to today, um, then you can feel free to send either myself or Jade an email and we can answer that for you.
Okay, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that way we can see everyone. Jay, do you want to answer a few? I got a few questions in my my you side. Go ahead and answer first, since I already answered a few. But yeah, there's a really good question about what are some entry level jobs that a high school student can work as, um, and maybe Jade, you can jump in there as well. I think, um, as I mentioned, veterinary technicians tend to be licensed depending on the state. So likely you can probably have a high school student that maybe is a veterinary assistant. And that could be maybe staffing like a front desk, potentially helping in some other capacities. Um, you know, volunteering at shelters could be another kind of entryway um, to at least get, get access to animals. Uh, you may not necessarily have the opportunity to work directly with the veterinarian, but I would say the, the biggest entry might be if you have pets and you have your local veterinarian is to, to start communicating with them and kind of establishing a relationship so that you can potentially have an in in either volunteering at their um, clinic or maybe having a paid position of sorts or even shadowing. That would probably be the best recommendation that I have for for high school students and maybe even middle school students that you can express your interest already to your local veterinarian. Um, and especially if you already have pets and you have a, a connection with them, that would be the best route to go. There is another question here about how many years are you in veterinary school? And is it different if you want to be a zoo vet? So really great question. Um, the majority of our uh, veterinary schools are four years uh, and depending on when you apply. So only, I would believe there's only one school that requires you to have an actual bachelor's degree in order to be able to apply and go into their veterinary school. So you can apply uh, with having had maybe two or three years of undergraduate education. And then it's traditionally a four year degree program. There are a few three year programs. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, that there are a few schools that offer you know, three years that you can finish your degree. And then there are some schools, specifically international schools, that are also um, schools that you can attend and then come back and be licensed in the US that will have students come directly from high school. So there are some options in terms of just how long it might take. Uh, and then with regards to being like a, a zoo vet or a more spe specialized maybe wildlife vet, um, as Jay kind of mentioned, there's like additional training that you would need to go through in addition to earning your uh, veterinary medicine degree. Uh, so there's additional training that could be either internships, fellowships, residencies, depending on that type of path. So you would have additional years. It really just depends on, on what you're looking to do. So potentially anywhere from an additional what, two to, two to five years, maybe additional um, in terms of being a more specialized veterinarian. You wanna answer some more in your side, Jade? Sure, I just actually wanted to add to this. Um, yeah, oh yeah. You want to be a zoo vet. So a lot of uh, veterinary colleges, the way the curriculum works is they basically, our classes are, um, designed so that you will pass what we call the NAVALI. So that's the exam that everyone needs to take to become a vet, <laughs> to get the DVM. Um, so a lot of our curriculum is focused on passing that exam because that's basically what decides if you're, um, not decides, that's a bad word to use, but it's basically, you need to pass that test to be a vet. So a lot of the curriculum is actually really focused on the big four animals. So that's dog, cat, cow, and horse. So if you're someone who knows for a fact you want to go into exotic care or zoo care, then going to further education after vet school is probably going to be a very likely route for you. Doesn't mean you have to specialize or board certify in that, but it means more so internships, um, not in terms of like summer internships, but more so kind of like they're like, internships and there's residents so internships are below the residents so if you want to do zoo or exotic it's something you might or end up having to do so that you do get that education and experience that's necessary to be a successful exotic vet um just wanted to add that in there <laughs> yeah um, no that's great so let's see um there was one question that pops out to me and it's um whether it's a good idea to be a vet tech before applying to vet school. So there are a handful of students who are former vet techs that, that realize, you know, I wanna be a vet. 
Um, but if you know you want to be a vet already, I would actually, then this is just my personal opinion. I would actually recommend not going the vet tech route before vet school and by vet tech route, like the licensed vet tech route, just because on top of your undergrad coursework, you don't want to put in more work for a license that you don't even really want, but, but you think is going to help you get into school. Um, I personally just don't, I personally just think that it would hold you back more than to just kind of get those hours working as a vet assistant or shadowing a vet. You don't have to be a vet tech to get some of the experiences that's necessary to become a, um, to go into vet school. Some clinics are so open to letting you, to teaching you skills, like drawing blood, um, learning how to, you know, get pee out of a dog or how to hospitalize properly or observe or watch surgeries. If that's something that you think you need a vet tech license for um, and why you're gearing towards trying to get a vet tech license for vet school, I would recommend highly against it. Um, you don't want you don't want to push back more because a lot of vet tech programs are actually like a year or two years. So if you know you want to go to vet school, um, try to get the hours another way. You can learn so, so much working at a clinic or volunteering at a clinic. You don't need to go to extra school for it. And go. I, I do want to add to that signing up for a vet tech program um, is also like paying for tuition. So vet school is already so um, expensive. You don't want to put more money into a license that you think it's just going to help you get into program into vet school. So that's just my word of advice. And I'll just add that think of them as two separate career paths in the same like overarching like industry, but they are, it's almost like saying you want to be a nurse or a veterinarian, right? Like it's not there. You don't need one to do the other necessarily, but um, if you're linking vet tech, then that is a, a specific route. And if you're thinking veterinary, like becoming a DVM, that's another route. So just kind of thinking about it in that way can be a little bit more helpful. There's a really good question here, and maybe Jade, you can you can give some some comments too, about what is a good job for someone who's interested in becoming a veterinarian but is more introverted. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I wouldn't. Um, I personally, I, I am, I might come off as like an extroverted person, so but a lot of my classmates are actually very introverted. Um, we actually take um, a test, like a, a test, a personality test on our first day of classes to find out what everyone's personality is. And you would be surprised. A lot of vets are actually introverts or some would even say like extroverted introverts. Um, but if you're looking for jobs that's for an introvert or if you want to, it's a question if you want to be a vet, but you're an introvert. Yeah. Um, like you, you know, with the research route, um, it's do it, you're not really dealing with a lot of people. You're dealing more so with the animals themselves or the work in front of you. Um, there's a lot, lots of work. There's, um, you can be a pathologist, which is basically the vets send you um, samples, whether it be pee, blood, skin. So, you're, di you're helping diagnose, um, you're helping a vet diagnose or confirm a diagnosis without actually having to deal with telling the families, oh, your pet has this, this is how you treat, or even like you're not working in a hospital, so you're working like behind the scenes. Um, in a zoo, you're also, a lot of zoo vets are not very um, with the public. It's most like, it's mostly the people that are with themselves. Uh, like they're, they're technicians, they're nurses. Uh, a lot of specialties actually are very not dealing with that much of the public as well. So you don't have to be an extrovert to be a vet. <laughs> yeah, and I, I thought you would be good to answer that because like, I think it's kind of a myth, right? That you have mm -hmm. to be extroverted and it's really not the case. There's another really good question that I'll answer is like, if, if there's any tests that you have to take to be admitted to veterinary like, colleges. Um, not it's different from like medical school where you have the MCAT in veterinary medicine. Um, the only one task that only now three schools use is the GRE, but many of our schools have moved away from standardized tests. Um, so I would say there is to answer the question is really like no, there is no specific test. There are maybe, like I said, three schools that require GRE, 
Uh, and even depending on by the time you apply, they may not be requiring that because uh, you know a lot of them are assessing and evaluating the use of standardized tests. Do you have other questions that you think you want to answer, Jade? Um, let's see. Someone mentioned, you know, so U of A does have an accredited, pro their program is three, three, three years. years, two years. Um, for the, oh, I'm getting a lot of questions about high school um, experiences. So in terms of grades, obviously it's really important to, I wouldn't say your GPA in high school is such a big factor in college and vet school admissions, but it is a big factor in college. So you obviously like want to go to a good college to go to go, want to go if you want to go to vet school. But I would say first, this is also my personal opinion, um, study hard in high school so that you can have that mental mindset of how to study well and keep going down that trajectory. But in high school, I would say get your experience, um, get your relationships, build those relationships with the vets. You want to work with a vet almost long term so that you can have that glowing recommendation letter and that way they're not strangers they don't th look at you as a stranger they know your personality they know that you're someone who will be a good vet and they can speak to that um so in high school i would say focus a lot more on getting your exposure what kind of vet you want to be what kind of animals you want to work with do you want to do research do you want to do gp do you want to travel the world so I would say um, in high school, focus a lot more on your experience, more so than what your GPA is going to be. Because in the end, you're not going to ask for your, I don't remember actually, but I don't remember my high school GPA being so important um, in my vet school applications. It's not, um, yeah, we don't we don't collect any high school GPA. Uh, the only thing I would say, if, if, if your high school allows you to take advanced placement courses, then that is something that could help you maybe meet requirements so that you don't have to take that course in undergrad. So for example, if you take like an AP chemistry or bio, biology, whatever that is, and you actually, you know, get the credit for that, then that's a requirement that's that you could have met right during high school because you've taken it as an AP course. Um, there was another good question uh, in terms of questions with regards to scholarships for veterinary school. So I would say um, AAVMC does have some resources where you can see the um, percent of first year students that receive uh, scholarships. So it's about almost half of first year students receive some sort of scholarship. Uh, and it, it varies in terms of the amounts. So typically each school will have some, some money that they will give out to their first year students. Um, in terms of other scholarships, we do have a page that kind of lists other, other places that you can seek out to get, you know, either scholarship money um, from different organizations. So I can more than happy to send maybe a few of these links afterwards and kind of be shared with you when the recording is sent out. Yeah, so you do have to meet, there's a good question about applying to veterinary school. Um, the biggest requirement is meeting all the prerequisite courses. So that means that you've taken all of the required coursework in a undergraduate institution or community college. Um, and as long as you meet those requirements, so those prerequisites, then you are you are able to apply to veterinary school. And that could, let's say, I mean, you could have done that in two years or three years. It really just depends on how long it takes you to meet those requirements. The majority of our students that go into veterinary medicine tend to major in either biology or animal science. And that because of that type of degree, it allows you to meet the majority, I would say, a really good chunk of all the requirements that are um, typically asked by our programs. Oh, there's a good question about math. How, Dave, can you answer the question? How is math uh, needed when becoming a veterinarian? Um, math is super important. Um, we have a whole course called Medical Calculations. Um, so it's like mixing science and math together. Math is so important. Every day you're going to be dosing something. Um, and it's not a quick addition. It's not a, a quick um, look it up because you would, there are resources like dosage books or even apps, but you want to be someone who is capable of double checking. And a lot of clinics uh, um, will have their vet techs dose them out, but 
the surgery usually won't continue until the vets confirm the doses. And you don't want to be someone who's relying on an app to do that. You want to be, you want to be confident in your work. But in terms of, let's say, trigonometry or um, I don't even remember, but that <laughs> I that S, I forgot what that was. Clearly, it wasn't important. So do well in your math courses, but I would say algebra really still continues on, especially in medical calculations and your foiling. Um, but knowing how to read a math, I would say my my big thing with math and science and vet school together when they're mixed, like medical calculations, is knowing how how to read a problem and turn it into a math equation. Um, because it's it's hard to say what kind of math is involved, but medical calculations for a lot of first year students it was very tricky. So you don't want to be someone who kind of puts math in the back burner um, because it does get hard. Um, I don't know. I did have a question on a study habit that I read that people recommend that I would recommend for long term memory. Um, because I like myself, um, in college, I was a very dependent on memorization, memorize, memorize, memorize. But when you're in vet school, um, you don't want to just memorize because when you're in clinics, you want to be able to, you want to know it. Um, you want to know the why and the how and memorizing can only get you so far. So in terms of long-term memory, what I like to do is actually, um, I'll study the material, but then let's say three or four days later, I'll quickly review it again. Um, and then just kind of keep it, keep notes of it and keep your flashcards. So there's awesome flashcard programs out there now that reminds you when to do your flashcards again. Um, it's called, there's one called Anki. That's what I like to use. It's A-N-K-I. Um, so rather than picking a subject that you want to review, they pick for you. Um, and it's really quick and it's really easy. Um, when, when you're in college or when you're in high school, I think a big thing with studying is you tend to memorize because it tends to be something or most of the time a class that you're not really interested in. It's more so a class you're just trying to pass and do really well in, and that's why you're just memorizing. When you're in vet school, you're in vet school because you want to be there. Um, so the classes, the classes are interesting. They will kind of take your brain to a different place that you'd never expected. And you're kind of just like, wow, that's why the dog that I saw at uh, when I was shadowing, that's why they, the vets did that, or that's why the vet or the dogs were showing this symptom. So memorizing, yes, it's important, but you'll find your, you'll, you'll be surprised when you're in vet school because the material actually syncs really well and a lot easier than a lot of my college classes did because it was something I'm it's I'm interested in it so it's something that kind of stays within me and something I, I want to keep thinking about because I'm like wow so I wouldn't be too um too worried about how to study because you'll find it also changes from high school to college to vet school um so that's my advice I don't know if that was great or if that was more so confusing but it's so different. What works for me might not work for you. Um, so just go at your own pace and you'll find out what works best because everyone is so different. Yeah. I think that's really great. Um, so I think there is some question around um, types of activities that you can do like in high school. So like if you're a member of 4-H, um, humane society, even like other organizations such as, you know, FFA, there's a lot of opportunities that I think that you can take advantage of. But something that I will mention is that many of our schools also do have some sometimes summer camp programs for high school students. They may have like day visits. So the other ways to just kind of get a little bit better sense of veterinary medicine might be to to look at these schools' websites and see what types of programs they have for high school students. So you may be able to go to a school and kind of even be there firsthand and see it. And that's another way to figure out, well, maybe I want to apply to this school in the future, or maybe I want to go somewhere else, right? So um, 
something to consider is that there are some schools that do have some of these opportunities uh, and they do allow you know high school students to participate. Um, oh, good question. Can you be a vet without performing surgery? So um, I think you will likely, and I think Jade, you probably don't get into that until a little bit later when you're on your rotation, potentially like your last year, or I guess it depends on when the schools have that. Um, so uh, I think every veterinary student will come out with some knowledge with regards to surgery, but depends on, you don't have to necessarily be a person that wants to specialize in that. So you will definitely have the opportunity and will be taught surgeries. But again, depending on which path you want to go, right? So let's say you want to go into research, then you may not be utilizing that surgery skill. Let's say you want to go into um, uh, potentially a food supply, right? Like, so you may not be doing some of those things or, or academia. Maybe you want to become a professor at some point um, and teach some of these veterinary courses. So you may not necessarily need some of that. So again, it just depends on what you're interested in. And you, I think you don't know until you actually do it, if it's something that you're, maybe you would like it, like you don't know until you actually have to, the chance and opportunity to do things. So I would say, even if you're a little bit concerned about not wanting to do surgeries, kind of have that open mind and see how that experience is. You may be surprised in yourself and realize that actually that might be something that you really like. Um, there's a question that's directed to you, Jade, about wildlife conservation. Did you see that one? Um, I think I did, but I don't I know. Think got lost. If you want to repeat it, um, it was related to uh, wildlife. What's your take on what happened in Florida with the pythons and the FWC? I don't know. I don't personally know what happened in Florida. Um, well, whoever wrote that wants to maybe explain further, then we can try to address <laughs> it later. I don't. I honestly don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> um, you'll yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's another question that I guess we, I think was answered, but um, how many years did it take to be a veterinarian in general? So if you decide to have a complete undergraduate degree, then obviously your four years undergrad. And then if you're going to a more traditional veterinary school, an additional four years, so eight years in total. Uh, but as I mentioned, there are some schools that University of Arizona has a three-year program, but also some of the international schools. So in the UK uh, also will accept students directly from high school. I think there's a question around research I saw. Um, so I think depending on, on if your interest is research, uh, and I think something that you can consider uh, doing is as you go into undergrad, just seeking out research opportunities. Um, I believe in veterinary school, there is opportunities for research. And then there are, you know, conferences where you can go and present research. But again, that kind of just depends on, you're probably going to have to like seek more of that opportunity than it coming to you. Uh, and I don't know if that's part of what you kind of found, Jay, but um, that's kind of what I've heard from other students that you kind of have to go and seek out those opportunities for research. Um, yeah, so I actually... I did research both in undergrad and I'm doing a little bit of research now because I want to specialize eventually. Um, but research, you definitely have to seek out for. They don't come, they don't definitely don't come to you. <laughs> um, but research is very interesting. Um, but research is also a lot of work and a lot of reading. So a, what a lot of it entails is what's called bench work. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's basically a lot of um, sitting in front of a microscope and feeding cells and finding out what the cells do, their levels of activity, how do they act with other things. Um, that's basically what a lot of research is. Um, one thing I do want to add is if you want to specialize in, um, sorry, I'm getting distracted by my cat. <laughs> if you want to specialize, um, a lot of them end up doing some sort of research. 
So a lot of uh, veterinary schools, most of them will have research labs and a lot of students do will um, take part in it. But like I said, vet school is a lot of work. So it's also a lot of deciding priorities if you want to do research and because you know you want to specialize, seek that opportunity out, find the vet that is working in that specialty you want to work at. So for instance, if you want, know you want to be a theory, 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 like a theory vet, which is a, a vet who works with a lot of reproductive systems. So a lot of vets who works with, let's say like pregnant animals, um, find the vet who does that and find out what research they do and then see if you can get involved. So that's just basically what research is. So yeah, just like Diana said, you have to seek it out um, and show them that you are capable of doing it for them. Because when you're a research, when you're doing research, you're it's almost a reflection of the professor or the vet who's doing that work. So you need to make sure you're doing a good job because your work also reflects back on them. So they will be picky on who decides to, on who they choose will do help them with their research. Because at the end of the day, they're, what you're researching is helping them publish their research or helping them find the answer to a question that they're trying to answer. So they want individuals who will help them reach that goal. There's another great question about when you actually apply for veterinary school. And again, it really just depends on, on when you feel you're ready. Um, but let's say if you, if you wanna go directly from your undergraduate education, uh, to veterinary school, you, you you know you're only going to have that kind of summer break. Then you would apply in your junior year of undergrad. If you're looking to have a gap year, meaning like you want a year break between your undergrad education and veterinary school, then you would apply in your senior year, like second semester, or sorry, spring semester senior year. So you're technically applying a year in advance of when you want to start. So just kind of keep that in mind because that is also kind of helpful. And and know that many students maybe thought that they were going to apply in a certain year, but then decided that as they looked at all what they had, they felt um, that they may need an extra year. That's perfectly okay. I know sometimes we get questions from students that is a gap year looked at as, as bad. And I would consider that a growth year, right? So not even gap year tends to have like a negative connotation. Think of it as a growth year. What are you doing in that time to continue your interest in veterinary medicine? Um, some people end up doing other degrees. So something else you can think about too is that there are a few um, veterinary programs that have dual degrees. So you can earn a master's in science, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it, um, MPH, a PhD. Like, so there's a lot of different opportunities depending on what route you wanna go into as well. And I know we have maybe one minute before the end of our time, but was there anything else maybe, Jay, do you wanna share with the group before? Um, yeah, so I forgot to mention in my terms of like advice of how to get how to kind of get into vet school. So animal care is obviously really important. So is veterinary care, but you also want to be a well rounded person. So I would also try to do things in terms of working with people <laughs> as well, or even in your school, like a leadership role would be re really helpful in that because they want, vet schools want to see that you're a well-rounded person. So not just someone who loves animals because everyone who's applying to vet school loves animals, obviously. So just show them or show them that you can, You there's more to you, whether it's a hobby that you're really good at and something that you're passionate about, like playing an instrument just something that makes you a well-rounded person, not just someone who has done a lot of work with animals and is good at taking care of animals. That's my last advice. <laughs> and the only thing that I will leave everyone with is um, know that there are people there to help you throughout the whole process, right? So you now know Jade and myself. So if at ever any point in time you have questions about veterinary school, getting prepared, you can feel free to reach out to us. Um, but everyone's willing to really help any student that's interested in this profession. And so don't be afraid to, to ask for help is really kind of my point. Uh, and hopefully you came away today with learning a little bit more about the process for veterinary school and hearing Jade's story about how she kind of had many different paths, right? Not every path is is very, link, uh, what is it, uh, linear. You can come at veterinary medicine in many different ways. So we definitely appreciate your time and a huge thank you to Jade as well for being here.
And feel free to email me with questions. I have summer soon. So if I don't answer you in the next week or so, it's because I have finals, but I will answer. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all. And we want to thank uh, both Diane and Jade for uh, all that you did. We really appreciate your uh, help uh, with us with this very important topic and for everybody for being here. We appreciate it. And we hope to see everybody at the ILC coming up in June very shortly. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.